So uh, my name is uh, Janice Law. I'm founder of the 11-year-old American Women Writers National Museum, a nonprofit. And our mission is to honor America's great premier women writers, historic and contemporary. Our speaker today is publishing executive Lauren Marino. She's executive editor of Hachette Books, and she's founding editor of Gotham Books. She's a magna cum laude graduate from Providence College. And a little interesting tidbit, she was born on an army base in Frankfurt, Germany during the war in Vietnam. Her other books include What Would Dolly Parton Do? and Jackie Kennedy and Cassini, A Fashion Love Affair, and How to Be a Diamond in a Rhinestone World. And speaking of diamonds in a rhinestone world, uh, this is her most recent book, which is Bookish Broads, which has a lot of diamonds in it. And uh, this book is um, profiles 60 uh, women writers worldwide. And today she's going to discuss American women writers, Louisa May Alcott, Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, Judy Bloom, Octavia Butler, Edith Wharton. And the focus of her discussion will be the circumstances and passion that made them into writers, the obstacles each had to overcome, reframing the literary canon that has long failed to recognize the immense contributions of women. Thank you, Ms. Marino, for our appearing today. Please go ahead. Thank you. So um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I wrote Bookish Broads as a way to honor the many incredible women um, who wrote themselves into history despite facing incredible obstacles. Um, really, you know, lack of access to education being one of the first ones really until the 20th century. Um, and, and shockingly, women still face a lot of prejudice. If you go to greatestbooks.org and look at the top 100 books in history, only 14 out of the 100 are by women. Um, so I'm just doing a small selection of women from the book. And these are little, these are um, really snapshots of them. Um, so they're gonna, we're gonna go through this and um, focus on how they continue, how they've challenged, inspired, and informed readers. And I'm going to share some slides to keep you all entertained beyond, let's see, beyond just listening to me talk. So, okay, can everyone see that now? Yep, okay, great. So, um, we are going to start with the wonderful Toni Morrison. In a New York Times book review interview, Henry Louis Gates asked Maya Angelou, what books would you recommend to someone who wants to know more about American culture? And she responded, read Toni Morrison's novels in chronological order. Toni was born Chloe Anthony Woford in Lorain, Ohio to a shipyard welder and a mother who sang in the church choir. Their families had migrated north um, during the Great Migration. They lived in six apartments growing up because they had so little money. They kept getting thrown out of apartments, um, including one that was set on fire by their landlord when they couldn't pay the $4 a month rent. She did grow up with Southern Black folklore, songs, and stories. As a young bookworm, she read Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Flaubert, um, Jane Austen, and she went to an integrated school and at 12 converted to Catholicism, which is when she took on her, baptis her baptismal name, which was Anthony, and her friends started calling her Tony. Um, shortly thereafter, a teacher from middle school sent home a note to her parents saying, you and your husband be, would be remiss in your duties if you do not see to it that this child goes to college. So her father took a second job in order to pay for her education. 
As an editor at Random House for 20 years, she published books by Angela Davis. That's a picture of her uh, mentoring Angela Davis over there. That's her at her desk at Random House. She also published Muhammad Ali, and she would do her writing early in the mornings and on the weekends. She joined a writing group that included Alice Walker. Um, and as the, uh, as you know, she, she eventually got divorced and as the head of her household, she fought for fair pay telling Random House that her little woman's raise was too low and that she meant serious business. And I can tell you as a book editor and as a divorced mother of two and, this, and uh, the head of my household, publishing salaries are still, <laughs> are still not, are barely enough for people to live on. Um, she wrote a story based on a girl that she knew as a child who had prayed for blue eyes because white, blue-eyed, straight-haired, blonde children were cons was considered the standard of beauty. It evolved into her novel, The Bluest Eye, which did not sell that well at first and got mixed reviews, but what she said about it, what was driving me to write was the silence. There were so many stories untold and unexamined. There was a wide vacuum in the literature. She was 39 when The, blue, when the Bluest Eye was published and she kept on writing. Four years later, she published Sula, which was nominated for the National Book Award and landed her on the cover of Newsweek as the first African-American woman to be on the cover of a national magazine since Zora Neale Hurston. So to be clear, she was a single mother raising two boys, working full time as an editor of groundbreaking top writers, fighting for equal pay and waking up before dawn to write. She had no role models, no understanding of what it meant to earn a living as a writer. As a teacher, yes, as an editor, yes, but she didn't personally know any other women writers who were successful. She said it looked very much like a male preserve. It was almost as if you needed permission to write. Well, clearly she persevered and there are some of the incredible books that we all still love. When she was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Beloved in 1993 for visionary force and poetic import, Morrison said, my work requires me to think about how free I can be as an African-American woman writer in my genderized, sexualized, wholly racialized world. She was asked time after time how she felt about being called a black writer. She said she never tired of the label, just the question. She was proud of her blackness and found great depth in it, not limitations. There were stories and a point of view that at that time were not being told. And with her own unique narrative style based on the oral tradition that she grew up with, she took the historical and she translated it into the personal, showing the black experience in intimate terms. She wanted slavery and its legacy, not just to be described, but to be felt. Her critics could be brutal. When she won the Nobel Prize in 1993, her combination of feminism and focus on black culture had middle passage author Charles Johnson saying that her win was a triumph of political correctness. The critic Stanley Crouch said, I hope this prize inspires her to write better books. Despite that, as a writer, she changed how stories were being told and knew how words could be used to heal and help shape society. And she used hers in powerful and unusual ways. Next up, we have Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou was a true Renaissance woman who over the course of her long and fruitful life was one time a streetcar conductor, a madam, a cook, a waitress, a civil rights activist, a playwright, a director, a dancer, and an actress. And of course, a poet and a writer. She won three Grammys for her spoken word albums. 
and was nominated for a Tony Award for her role in the 1972 play, Look Away. And she toured Europe in Porgy and Bess. She also accompanied Martin Luther King at his New York City speeches. She recited a poem she wrote for the occasion of Bill Clinton's inauguration and was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Oprah Winfrey called her one of her most important teachers, my mentor, mother, sister, and friend. She was born Marguerite Annie Johnson in St. Louis, Missouri. At seven years old, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend. And when she told her family about it, her uncles killed the man. She had learned her voice could kill people. She learned the power of her voice. And as a result, she did not speak for the next six years. Her grandmother tied a pencil with a string and a, with a little notebook um, for her and she carried it everywhere using notes to communicate. And during her time of silence, she read every book that she could get her hands on. She also learned to listen and observe very carefully and said, I used to think I could make my whole body an ear and I could walk into a room and absorb sound. It's really because I love to hear human beings talk and sing that I've listened so assiduously and out of that came a love of language. Through that listening, she started to, be to develop as a writer and she published a total of 36 books. Here's just a small collection of those books. She came to understand and write about the human condition in all of its pain and glory, failures and triumphs, as well as the resilience that she knew firsthand that it takes to survive. In 1970, she published the first book in what would be a, a seven volume autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, in it, she wrote about her childhood and how the power of words and ideas helped form and save her. Now a beloved classic, it was an international sensation when it came out. It's also been banned many times for its sexual assault scene. Um, and it took incredible courage for her to write it, but it is now uh, required reading in schools all over the world. After living in Ghana and fighting against apartheid, she eventually settled down at a professorship at Wake Forest University where she remained until the rest of her life. She was six feet tall, bodacious, wise and inspiring. And she left a powerful legacy with her poems, books, resilience oh. and activism. Yes. After having a complex so much, living so fully, when asked what dreams she had left, she replied, to write a sentence so gracious, it slips right off the page. That's it. Next up is Octavia Butler. As a child, Octavia's aunt told her, honey, Negroes can't be writers. But she still begged her mother for a Remington typewriter and started recording her stories. She said she was inspired to write science fiction when she was 12 after watching a what she called a terrible movie, Devil Girl from Mars, you can see the poster there on the screen, about a bunch of man-hungry Martian women. She thought to herself, geez, I can write a better story than that. She started devouring science fiction magazines and submitting her stories to them. She was born in Pasadena, California, where her father shined shoes and her mother was a housekeeper. Her father died when she was four. She was extremely tall, socially awkward, and she had dyslexia, which is pretty incredible for a writer. Um, but she wasn't diagnosed at the time, and so she did very poorly in school, but it didn't stop her from escaping into the world of books and writing. She had jobs as a secretary and an assembly line worker in a factory while she was working on her writing, eventually being able to support herself full time when she published her novel, Kindred. As a trailblazer in a genre dominated by white men, Butler asked the question, why aren't there more science fiction black writers? Well, there aren't because there aren't. And she said, what we don't see, we assume we can't be. What a destructive assumption. She was ahead of her time. 
She started writing in the 1970s and the rest of the world is now just catching up with her. Butler has influenced countless artists and writers of all kinds. Hilton Owls has identified her as the dominant artistic force throughout Beyonce's film version of Lemonade. And Ava DuVernay is adapting Dawn, one of Butler's xenogenesis novels for television. Janelle Monet said that Butler was a direct influence for her album, The Arch Android. She was also the, really in many ways, the impetus behind the Afrofuturism movement. As the author of 12 novels and numerous short stories, she's also the first science fiction writer to receive a MacArthur Genius Fellowship. As the lone black female voice in a genre populated by white men, she populated her fiction with telekinetic gods, cyborgs, extraterrestrials, the undead, and third, third gender humanoids, repurposing these familiar science fiction tropes to explore issues of racial power, ambiguous gender identity, and sexual taboo. In Kindred, for example, a black woman from the present inexplicably travels back in time to the antebellum South where ha she has to confront the horrors of slavery. In her Xenogenesis series, aliens employ genetic engineering to create human alien hybrids, which leads to a war between the races. She's been called a predictor of the future and a prophetess because her books discuss the repercussions of climate change well before it became part of the collective consciousness, and many of her themes pretend the current political climate. One of her characters, for example, was a presidential candidate who appealed to the religious right with the slogan, help us to make America great again. That was written by her in 1998. In response, she said her books are not prophetic as much as they are cautionary tales. These science fiction fables, and she called several of them parables, discussed racism, misogyny, and patriarchy with refreshing bluntness, all written with a rich understanding of detail, science, spirituality, mysticism, and mythology. Just this past fall, her book, The Parable of the Sower, hit the New York Times bestseller list for the very first time. Uh, 14 years after her early death at age 58. And just recently, the Mars rover landing station was named after her. So she's made history, not just on Earth, but back on Mars, which is appropriate given her beginnings. Now on to Louisa May Alcott. Alcott's parents were abolitionists, transcendental de dentalists, and station masters on the Underground Railroad. Bonson, her zealot father, was an education reformer whose schools consistently sparked controversy, uh, resulting in being unable to financially support his family. His temple school in Boston was closed after he admitted an African-American student and all of the other parents withdrew their children. He then moved his wife and four daughters to Fruitlands, and there's a picture of the farm down there, which was a utopian society that included a working farm and a commune based on consuming no animal products and using no outside labor. But this lasted only seven months because Louise's mother, Abby, uh, put her foot down after it became clear that was her and her daughters that were doing all of the work on the farm and keeping the whole experiment going. The men would take long countryside walks to discuss philosophy and the women would be milking the clouds, cooking the food, plowing the fields, etc. Louisa later wrote a satire of this experience called Transcendental Wild Oats that was published in a New York newspaper in 1873. And their most permanent home was Orchard House. There's a photo there in Concord, Massachusetts, where they finally settled down from 1858 to 1877, living across the street from Ralph Waldo Emerson. As a result of her father's inability to provide financial support, the family moved more than 20 times in 30 years. 
Louisa vowed to pull her pathetic family, which she called it a pathetic family, out of poverty and began working at age 15, doing any job available as a governess, teacher, laundress, taking in sewing, and eventually as a writer. When she submitted an essay called How I Went Out to Service about her experience as a governor, it was rejected by publishers who told her, stick to your teaching, Miss Alcott, you can't write. After she proved him wrong and made a bundle and had publishers fighting over her, she said that she felt her biggest success was being able to support her family and let them live in comfort, but she also got a naughty satisfaction in proving that it was better not to stick to teaching as advised, but to write. It was important for her to be paid well for her work, so she taught herself how to write stories that would sell um, under a pseudonym A.M. Bernard, writing lurid Gothic um, thrillers full of love affairs and opium addictions, such as A Long Fatal Love Chase, Behind a Mask, and Pauline's, pa Pauline's Passion and Punishment. Her, face, her first major literary and commercial success was written under her own name. It was a fictionalized version of her own experience working at a Union hospital in Georgetown as a military nurse during the first year of the Civil War. It was based on her letters and her daily journals, and it was a breakthrough piece of writing, opening the public's eyes to the horrors and the conditions of military hospitals. Women had not been allowed to be nurses at first, but that changed as the seriousness and the length of the Civil War became clear. Um, she unfortunately contracted typhoid pneumonia and had to return, return home early and was very sick after. For the rest of her life, she was often delusional and poisoned by the mercurous chloride that was used to treat her and she suffered from chronic pain, weakness, and hallucination for the rest of her life. And so it's pretty incredible to see what she accomplished despite that. After her recovery, she accepted the editorship of a children's magazine called the Mary Museum and became its uh, major contributor. When Thomas Niles, a partner at publishers Robert Brothers, asked her to write a book for girls in, 19, in 1867, she went into her writer's vortex and wrote the first part of what would become Little Women, which she wrote in three months. She amassed a fortune with the success of her novels for young readers, providing her parents, siblings, nieces, and nephews um, all with a comfortable lifestyle, proving that women could make a living as a self-trained, unformally educated professional writer. Alcott and her mother were also deeply involved in the women's suffrage movement, canvassing door to door, encouraging women to register to vote. In 1879, Louisa was registered as the first woman to vote in the Concord School Committee election. Her writing also expressed her views on many of the era's ideas for social reform, including women's rights, racial integration, and education. Now we're gonna take a leap in time to Judy Bloom. Um, and I ask, is there a tween girl in America who hasn't read, Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, or passed forever around in the classroom, hiding it under their mattress at night or hiding it in their desk so that the teachers and parents wouldn't see it. Without Judy Bloom's guidance, how would any of us have gotten through all the embarrassment, challenges, and confusion of puberty? As an adult, she wrote, she started writing the books that, wished, that she wished that she had when she was growing up. She taught generations of young people not to be ashamed of their bodies during adolescence. And she oh. still receives more than 2000 letters a week from young people who see her as a safe person where they, where they can ask her about their concerns. She, she grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey in the 1950s, the daughter of a dentist and a homemaker she suffered from a lot of anxiety, which expressed itself through stomach problems and, and eczema. She was so bored with the books available for teenage girls that when she had to write uh, book reports for school, she would sometimes invent her own books that did not exist to write about. She got married as a junior in college. 
She was pregnant soon after. She became a suburban wife and mom with two children, but she was lonely, frustrated, um, and very unhappy in her marriage. She, um, the year that she started writing, she had spent an entire year in bed with a variety of illness and ailments, and she says that writing saved her. She would end up getting divorced and married three times, and um, she drew upon that difficult time in her life when she wrote her first book for grown up at the time called Wifey, where the protagonist tries to escape boredom and, uh, and, a, and an unhappy marriage. When the book came out, there was concern it was going to be too shocking for her audience and end her career, but it wasn't. It sold well over 4 million copies. Over five, more than five decades, she's written books for children of all ages. She's won um, she sold 85 million copies. She's won countless awards, too many to um, discuss here. Uh, but despite her popularity since the 1980s, her books have consistently appeared on the American Library Association's list of banned books. Here is a list of just some of the books um, that are banned over and over again. And I will say all of these books are some of the favorite books of my childhood. Um, as a result of that, she's a champion for speech free speech and intellectual freedom, and she works very hard with the National Coalition Against Censorship. And our last writer today is Edith Wharton. Um, Edith Newbolt Jones was one of the original Joneses that the rest of us were meant to keep up with. Her family's wealth made her part of what a 1929 New Yorker article described as a strict clan of wealth uh, making intercellular marriages, attending winter balls, dominating certain smart spots on the eastern seaboard, a hard hierarchy of male money, female modesty, and morals. She was restricted on the one hand by her upbringing, uh, the prejudice and snobbery of her class and education, but on the other hand, she was a subversive thinker, writing critically not only of the greed and materialism she witnessed in her upbringing, but also of American foreign policy and capitalism, and perhaps even democracy herself, which is a very complicated position to be in when you have personally benefited so much from those very things. From her youngest days, uh, she would make up lengthy narratives while pacing around, holding a book in her hand before she could even read, um, to the point that it alarmed her parents, since writing was not considered becoming to a woman of her class. She was known for always scribbling and sold her first poem at church when she was only 15, privately publishing her first volume of poems when she was 16, and at 18 she was publishing poetry in the Atlantic Monthly and started writing novellas. Um, her first book, major book, was written in swanky Newport, Rhode Island. There's her house there uh, in, Rhode Island, in Newport. Um, she also wrote Italian Villas and Their Gardens and the Decoration of Houses um, based on her, as what she had learned decorating the, the house and the gardens of her estate in Lenox, Massachusetts, which was the Mount, where she, she definitely, you know, she carefully curated every piece of art, every piece of furniture, every wall hanging. Um, and this is also where she had her desk, her own suite of rooms where she had privacy. It's here where she wrote The House of Mirth and Ethan Frome. Once she started publishing, from that point on, she put out a book a year, writing 40 books in 40 years, which is pretty mind boggling, writing pages every single morning, letting them drop on the floor to be organized later until the end of her life. She also had a couple of failed engage engagements after her debut at 17. She was considered an old maid at 23. She had an unhealthy marriage to a mentally unstable alcoholic. She ran off with a bisexual Andover and Harvard man who had been breaking hearts uh, in men and women all across the United States and Europe. Um, fortunately, she had her own money, both inherited and from her writing, so she was able to get a divorce, and she moved off to France, where she lived for the rest of her life. 
Um, her novels reflect many of these struggles, criticizing social convention and its consequences. Unhappy marriages, secret and emotional, secret emotional and sexual longing, and anxiety about making a proper match. And I'm sure all of these books are uh, familiar to all of you. She was also the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for Literature for the Age of Innocence. What I didn't know when I sat down to research this book was that during World War I, she stayed in France, ded dedicating herself to a variety of ch charitable and humanitarian organizations. She was also one of the very few journalists and writers reporting from the front lines for American publications. I mean, you see her here on the front lines of World War I. This was very unusual for a woman. It was very dangerous work. You see her there with a bunch of soldiers. Um, she wrote a book called Fighting France about that time. Um, and in 1916, she received the French Legion of Honor for all of her work. And those are just six of the 65 women that I profile in Bookish Broads. I hope you learned something new today and please feel free to order the book, email me any questions that you have and back to you, Janice. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Marina. We really, really appreciate it. It was a beautiful lecture and the slides were great. So uh, forgive my